especially like to welcome you on behalf of the American Sephardi Federation Institute of Jewish Experience um, and the Language Institute. Sorry, I can't speak. I don't know why. <laughs> um, we like to invite you to this wonderful program. I'm very excited about it. I've heard Dr. Benor speak before and not to be missed. Uh, she is, uh, today we're talking about Jewish languages today, endangered, surviving, and thriving. Dr. Benor, Dr. Sarah Benor is professor of contemporary Jewish studies at Hebrew Union College, the Jewish Institute of Religion in the Los Angeles campus, and adjunct professor by courtesy in the University of Southern California Linguistics Department. Um, she received her PhD from Stanford University in Linguistics in 2004, and she has published and lectured widely about Jewish languages, linguistics, Yiddish, American Jews, and Orthodox Jews, which are represented in her books. Take a look. I strongly encourage you to check out her, the books that she has written as well. And again, you have not come to hear me, so I'm going to pass the microphone over to Dr. Benor. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm very excited to hear. Thank you, Dvora, and uh, thank you so much to ASF, and uh, it's, it's just such a pleasure to work with this wonderful organization that has such a similar mission to ours and uh, really aligns with us in, in multiple ways. So we're partnering on multiple events, including this one, and I'm really honored to, to be speaking to such a large group today, and it's really great that you're really coming from all around the world, some probably around the corner from me in LA and uh, some from many other countries. And, uh, and so it's really an honor. I'm gonna share my screen with you so you can see some images and hear some music at various points in this talk. Okay. So as you know, the Jewish people started out in the land of Israel, this little purple dot in the middle of the screen here, and due to various internal and external factors migrated throughout the Middle East, North Africa, parts of Asia, and much of Europe. And wherever they moved to, they picked up a version of the local language. So they, in Spain, picked up a Jewish version of Spanish, Judeo-Spanish, and in, in uh, Georgia, picked up a Jewish version of Georgian, and in Arabic-speaking countries, picked up a Jewish version of Arabic. And the two most famous Jewish languages, Yiddish and Ladino, are actually exceptions in the history of Jewish languages because they were maintained for centuries away from the land that they originated in. So what is a Jewish language? Well, there are many common features of Jewish, and I'll be using the term Jewish language and Jewish language variety interchangeably. So a Jewish language variety has a non-Jewish base language with distinctive features. And what are those distinctive features? Well, the most prominent and salient one is the Hebrew and Aramaic component. And that's because Jews have continued to use Hebrew and Aramaic for our sacred texts, for liturgy, and for studying biblical and rabbinic literature. And then we translate those texts often in a word-for-word -word way. And that has an influence on the spoken language sometimes. And there are many loan words, that is words from one language that's used within another language. Uh, from Hebrew and Aramaic because of this continual use of our sacred texts. So you have Hebrew and Aramaic words for religious concepts, for secretive language, especially to refer to non-Jews and taboo concepts, euphemisms for parts of the body, and for death. And there are also influences from other Jewish languages that people, that Jews spoke before their current migration. And there are also other distinctive features. Now getting into all of these distinctive features would be a whole separate talk. So for now, I'm not going to focus on those. But I just want to point out another one, which is the Hebrew writing system that historically, most but not all Jewish languages were written in Hebrew letters, which are actually Aramaic letters. So what happened? Well, there were many historical developments that led to the decline of long-standing Jewish language varieties. In the 18th to 20th centuries, 
There was emancipation that enabled Jews to participate fully in society rather than as a separate class of people. And nationalistic policies led to requirements that Jews learn the local language. Jews also moved from more rural areas to more urban areas along with much of the populations and therefore learned more standardized versions of the, their languages. Um, and in the 20th century, the Holocaust and Stalinism actually led to the death of many speakers of these longstanding languages. And then migrations also caused major shifts in languages where most of the Jews who lived in the places that you saw on the map a minute ago moved to the Americas, to Israel, and to Western Europe. So here you see some of the migration patterns, a very messy map because there were many migration patterns. And in these new places that Jews moved to, they picked up Jewish versions of the local languages. So Jewish English, Jewish Latin American Spanish, Jewish Portuguese, et cetera, et cetera. And these new Jewish language varieties are thriving because Jews are living in these places and developing these new language varieties. And in fact, they, these new Jewish language varieties have all of the same features of the other longstanding Jewish language varieties, except for the Hebrew writing system, because there is an expectation of much more widespread literacy in the countries that Jews live in now than when uh, these other languages originated mostly in, in medieval times and Jews were not expected to learn Arabic script in, in Muslim countries or Latin script in Christian countries. So that's the new languages, but what about the longstanding languages? Let's talk about how each of them is faring today. And uh, the answer is Yiddish is doing quite well and all of the others are endangered or close to endangered. So why is Yiddish doing well? Because of Hasidic communities. They have many children and Yiddish is very strong in these communities and therefore the um, number of Yiddish speakers in Hasidic communities is increasing because of the large families. Outside of Hasidic communities, there is strong post-vernacular engagement with Yiddish. What does that mean? Post-vernacular engagement means people engaging with a language in a way that's not just primary communication. So talking about the language or singing songs in the language, celebrating the language. Many of the talks that you've had here have been post-vernacular engagement with various Jewish languages, learning about the languages, or maybe buying refrigerator magnets with Yiddish words on them, or uh, all sorts of ways of engaging with Yiddish in ways other than primary communication, where the symbolic level of the language is more important than the primary semantic level, than what's actually said. So when we're talking about language endangerment, we're, we're talking about a scale um, that where a language can range from international to provincial, to developing, to vigorous. These are the good stages of a language where it's doing well. And you don't need to read all this. I'm just giving you a general overview. And then we get to the bad, the bad stages where they're not doing as well. They're threatened or shifting or moribund or nearly extinct, dormant. We don't like to use the word extinct because the idea is that the language is now dormant, but it is possible that uh, people might pick it up later. And I'm adding in here the word infused because in some cases, communities can infuse a language into their communal activities to, uh, in, in post-vernacular ways to have that symbolic proficiency, but that language might still be considered dormant because it's not spoken as a language of communication and there are no people who have full, full knowledge of the language. So these stages are not great because they're too black and white. Some of them say things like the only speakers who speak the language are X, but what if there are one or two who are younger or who are outside of that territory? Also, in the case of Jewish language varieties, sometimes speakers acquire a standard version of the language, but maintain elements 
of their ancestors Jewish variety. And we see this with Judeo-Italian and Judeo-Greek. So would we say that Judeo-Italian and Judeo-Greek are dormant because they're not speaking exactly like their ancestors did, they're speaking more standard, but with some phrases from their ancestors' languages, it gets, gets a little complicated there. Another question is, where do you draw the line between a language and a dialect? You might have been thinking that at the beginning when I was talking about longstanding Jewish languages and new Jewish language varieties. Well, it, it is a complicated question because historically many Jewish languages have been mutually intelligible with the local non-Jewish language. So wouldn't they then be considered dialects of the local language rather than separate languages? Well, that's because usually we consider mutual intelligibility, whether people can understand each other, to be a criterion for distinguishing between two dialects of the same language and two separate languages. But that gets complicated. Sometimes people say they understand other people, but then that group says they don't understand the first group. Uh, and then um, we have the issue of speaker versus non-speaker that is, it, does someone has to be, have to be fluent to be considered a speaker of a language? Do they have to actually use the language? What if they just engage with the language post vernacularly? Does that count as being a speaker of a language? Despite these problems, however, I would still say these statistics are useful because they enable us to get a general sense of how a language is doing. So how are Jewish languages doing according to this scale of intergenerational disruption? Well, we see that Yiddish is doing well, Judeo-Arabic, Ladino, Judeo-Persian, etc. Most of these languages are in stages seven or higher, that is endangered. And, but Judeo-Tajik and Judeo-Tat are doing a little bit better according to these statistics that um, they're uh, may be considered vigorous in certain communities and threatened or shifting in others, although I think that is, is changing pretty quickly. But there's also post-vernacular engagement for many of these languages. And I think that's an important thing to think about that even if a language is endangered, if it is considered moribund, it can still have a second life through this post-vernacular engagement. And I'm going to demonstrate that for each of these language varieties, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Tat, known as Juhuri, Judeo-Median, which is languages spoken in Iran that are not in the Persian family, Judeo-Malayalam, spoken in southern India, and Jewish Neo-Aramaic, spoken in the Kurdish region. And for each, I'm going to give a brief history, talk about the current status, and give some information about post-vernacular activity. And there will be time at the end for questions and conversation. So first, Ladino. As I said before, Ladino is one of these languages that is an exception in the history of the diaspora because it was maintained for centuries away from the place where it originated. It originated in Spain, Judeo-Spanish, but then it was maintained for centuries in the Ottoman Empire and in North Africa. And here it's known as Hakitia in, in North Africa, and here known as Ladino or Judesmo. There was a very vibrant Ladino press, much literature, drama, and even a lot of rabbinic literature written in Ladino. Today, several thousand people speak Ladino. Most live in Israel, the Americas, Turkey, and the Balkans. Almost all are elderly, but there is um, a growing contingent of young people who are learning the language. Ladino has official recognition and financial support in Israel, in Bosnia, and in Spain. It's taught at several major universities, especially in Israel, and there are various meta-linguistic communities. That is a community that engages around a language even if people don't speak it fully. Um, although this one here, Ladina Comunita, does require some skill in the language because it's an email list where all the messages must be written in Ladino. So in addition to vernacular use of the language, there's also post-vernacular use here because not only are they writing in Ladino, they're often writing about Ladino. 
And there are several other metalinguistic communities online, like Encontros de Alhad, which is um, encounters on Sunday, uh, and people uh, meet to discuss various issues in Ladino. There's a Balabai and a Musafir, a host and a guest, and they have these conversations in Ladino. And then there are smaller communities in local um, places around, around uh, North America in particular, and elsewhere in the world as well. And food, like Drora mentioned at the beginning, plays a big role in post-vernacular use of Ladino. Um, there are many um, um, cultural events that include Sephardic foods like burekas and bulemas, etc. And there's also um, post vernacular use in music. I'm going to give you a few brief clips of the kinds uh, of two different kinds of Ladino music. We have Okay, I know. I, I want to listen to more too, but we have to move on to the next uh, lecture, the next uh, video. So here is um, a more modern version. And, and in many Jewish languages, we do see post-vernacular engagement with both traditional musical forms and more contemporary musical forms. So that was Flori Jagoda or Yagoda. Uh, and this one is Sarah Aroeste uh, singing in Ladino in a more contemporary style. Okay, so uh, we also see Ladino infusion at Sephardic Adventure Camp, which is a sleepaway summer camp outside of Seattle that caters to the great grandchildren of immigrants from Rhodes and Turkey to Seattle and also to other parts of the United States and Canada. And um, they infuse Ladino into their activities. They get extra points in their color war for having Ladino on their banner. And they sing Ladino songs and they have Ladino word of the day. So despite all this post vernacular use, this language is considered moribund because it is rarely spoken by younger people. Um, I do know one family raising their kids in Ladino and many young adults who are learning it, but most of the speakers are quite elderly. And um, it, however, this language is very important for group identity among Sephardic Jews. Turning now to Judeo-Arabic, the yellow areas on the map are areas where Judeo-Arabic has been spoken. And there is a very rich history of literature in Judeo-Arabic. Um, Judeo-Arabic was even used before the Islamic conquests. And um, you may have heard of some classical Judeo-Arabic texts from Saadia Gaon, Yehuda Halevi, Maimonides, etc. And many Judeo-Arabic texts were found in the Cairo Geniza. There are many varieties of Judeo-Arabic, and these tend to be more similar to the local non-Jewish variety than to each other. So someone from Egypt and someone from Yemen might even have trouble understanding each other because Arabic in Egypt and Arabic in Yemen are different enough that it might be hard to understand each other. But there are also some common traits that the, in, in Egyptian Judeo-Arabic, you see some traits from Moroccan and Syrian Judeo-Arabic because of migrations throughout history. In the 19th and 20th centuries, there were many Judeo-Arabic periodicals from Mumbai to Morocco to Baghdad, and um, mostly written in Hebrew letters. Now, most speakers moved to Israel and France, Canada, Mexico, and the United States from the 1940s to the 1960s, and that led to major declines in the use of Judeo-Arabic. There are still sizable Jewish communities in North Africa today, in Morocco and in Tunisia, 
uh, but most Jews in Morocco speak French and most in Tunisia speak Muslim Tunisian Arabic with some elements of their ancestral Judeo-Arabic. The Israeli government offers support for cultural production in Yiddish and Ladino, but not in Judeo-Arabic and other languages. Despite this lack of financial support, there is some cultural production in Judeo-Arabic, and I'll give you a few clips from uh, songs from coming out of Israel today. على زهر الفسيح تجي وتغني هو ونشوفو الزين على شدوي ونشوفو الزين على شدوي هو ليبيا هو ليبيا هو ليبيا اوكي ام غانا جو اون تو ذا نيكست وان ذس از um, a relatively recent uh, original song in Baghdadi Judeo Arabic. <laughs> جسوس التهماني ونهزمت قجر وانا بطرقيت أمي بس حمد الله وصلت مشيت سلامة كنت كانوا جغادي وطبتوا حماما بوحي كنت Okay, so there is a sizable community, especially from Iraq, uh, of people who are, are getting more interested in their ancestral language now. So, however, Judeo-Arabic is also moribund, but there is some post vernacular use and it's important for group identity. Turning now to Judeo Tat, also known as Juhuri, and this is- Before you continue, oh, can you yes. just, sorry, um, somebody was just asking what post vernacular means and I'm not sure if she's the only one, or he's the only one that asked oh, that. Sure. So. I'll explain it again. So it's engaging with the language in ways other than as primary communication, having uh, singing songs in the language and, um, having conversations, celebrating the language, festivals about the language, buying products with the language on it, that kind of thing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so Juhuri is spoken in Azerbaijan and Dagestan. And uh, here's another map showing some places where Juhuri is spoken um, by the community known as the Mountain Jews or the Kavkazim. And the, um, this is the, um, some cities that, that it has been spoken in are Derbent, Baku, and Kuba. And there has been a community in these areas since ancient times. This language is in the Persian family. Uh, so you can see it's actually closer to per the, per the modern Persian language than some of the languages spoken in Iran, even though it's in a different region. And it's similar to Muslim Tat, but has many differences. There are some books written in Juhuri. Originally, it was written in Hebrew letters and then in Cyrillic letters uh, and with a brief stint with Latin letters as well, based on language policies of the Soviet Union. And here are some examples of books that have been written in Juhuri and some periodicals. Um, uh, starting in 1915 and even going as late as 1991. And in fact, Tat, which referred to Judeo Tat, was one of the 10 official languages in the USSR Republic of Dagestan. One of the distinctions, the few Jewish languages that have the distinctions of having been an official language of a country. However, from the 19th century to today, Judeo-Tat has slowly been replaced by 
Azerbaijani, Russian, and other languages in the Caucasus region, and by Hebrew in Israel. Some older people still use it, and parents use it as a secret language. And there is some post-vernacular activity, some music that is still performed in Juhuri. However, it's still transmitted to children, apparently, in one town. Um, and the latest research about this town's use of language is from 2008. So I think the situation is a little different now because I think some people have migrated to Israel from this region. But this is just a few pictures of this really cool town that I really want to visit. Um, it's called Kirmizi Kasaba, also known as Krasnaya Sloboda, or Red Village, I believe. And, and so here, that was the synagogue, and this is the school. You can see Cheder up there. Uh, this is the cemetery, and you can see they follow the traditions of the region of having a portrait of the deceased on the gravestones. And even in Kirmizi Kasaba, all community members also speak other languages and educational instruction is in other languages. So this is, I would say in, in stage 6B threatened because it is used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but it is losing users. And as more and more people leave the region, it is even more threatened. Now I'm turning to Iran, and um, here we're going to talk about Judeo-Median. Um, and the, do you see where that circle is? I'll make it appear again there. So it is, um, the Median language is on a different branch of the Iranian language family. And it's, it's different enough from Persian that most speakers of Persian can't really understand the people who speak these languages. And there are several Jewish language varieties spoken in Iran that uh, are different enough from Persian um, in various towns that Jew and cities that Jews have lived in, like Kashan and Isfahan, Hamadan, Borujerd, et cetera. And um, these languages are not mutually intelligible for the most part with each other. There are some similarities. Uh, here, here you see some examples where the words for big, for example, are totally different in all the languages, but the word for cat is similar in four of them and totally different word in, in, these, in these other languages. Um, and Shirazi is actually not a Judeo-Median language. It's closer to Persian, but still mutually unintelligible with Persian. Now, what happened? Well, from the mid 20th century, around the mid 20th century, most Jews learned standard Persian with some Hebrew words in their cities and towns or after moving to Tehran because of language policies. And we'll be having an event that focuses on that transition in um, just a week and a half uh, on March 13th. Uh, the Jewish Language Project is having an online event about that. And, um, and then in addition to Jews learning standard Persian, most Jews from Iran have left Iran and moved to New York, Los Angeles, Israel, and elsewhere where they have picked up Hebrew, English, and other languages. But there is some work currently being done to document these languages, and we're working with our partner, our partner organizations, the Endangered Language Alliance and Wikitongues, and the Living Tongues Institute to not only record speakers of these languages, but to transcribe their interviews and to create dictionaries based on these languages. The next language is Jewish Neo-Aramaic, and we're almost done. I know this is a lot of material, but uh, I hope you're finding it uh, useful and enriching. So Jewish Neo-Aramaic is spoken in the Kurdish region between Iran, Iraq, and Turkey. And here's another picture of, of that region. And the communities are ancient in these languages, it's so is the language in, in these territories. Um, but the, the way that Jews speak Aramaic today is much changed from the Aramaic that is encoded in our rabbinic literature. Um, and so it's the, the way they speak is related to the language of the Talmud, but, but quite different. Um, and 
some of these dialects of Jewish Neo-Aramaic were spoken by several thousand people in towns and some just by a few families in small villages. And interestingly, the Jewish dialects are more similar to each other than to the Christian Aramaic dialects nearby. So let me give you a little example of this. This is four towns that are pretty close to each other. And we see that the Christian dialects have very different words for all of these, whereas the Jewish words are quite similar for most of them. And the Jewish Neo-Aramaic speakers in the Kurdish region also spoke local languages like Kurdish, which is related to Persian, and Turkish, and Farsi, and Arabic, and Russian. And these local languages have influenced their Jewish Neo-Aramaic so that they are different enough from uh, the language of the Talmud. Most speakers of Jewish Neo-Aramaic moved to Israel some to the US and Europe. And there is some post vernacular engagement with this language, such as this great book by Ariel Sabar about the language spoken by his father, Jonas Sabar, uh, who is a famous researcher of Jewish Neo Aramaic. Um, and there are speakers today in Israel who are mostly elderly, well, pretty much all elderly, um, and some are from uh, you know from different regions who speak basically two different main dialects of Jewish Neo-Aramaic and there are monthly cultural gatherings, poetry readings, stand-up comedy, call-in radio shows, um, a new organization that has recently formed called the Lishana Institute that's doing research on the language and, um, and advocating for policies from the Israeli government in support of Jewish Neo-Aramaic. And there is some new music coming out of um, um, younger people who are, who are descended from speakers of Jewish Neo-Aramaic and are embracing the language of their parents and grandparents. So again, this language is moribund, but there is some post vernacular use used uh, for, for music and, and comedy and people talking about the language. And it's, it's important for group identity among Kurdish Jews, especially in Israel. And the last language that I wanna focus on is Jewish Malayalam. Jewish Malayalam is spoken in Southern India and it is, a long-standing Jewish community there in the Kerala region of India and some of the towns and cities that they lived in include Cochin, Ernakulam, Parur, Chenamangalam, and Mala. Um, and the first evidence of Jews in the region is from the 9th century CE where we have traders that arrived in India via the Indian Ocean. We have many texts in Jewish Malayalam, but they're mostly in Malayalam script, not in Hebrew script, which is a difference between this and other longstanding Jewish languages. We have Bible stories and prayers in Jewish Malayalam and many songs, especially Jewish women's wedding songs from the 18th century on. Jewish Malayalam is mostly intelligible to local Hindu, Christian, and Muslim varieties, but it's more similar to the Muslim varieties. And here I'll give you some examples of that, some words in uh, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, and Hindu versions of Malayalam. And you can see some cases where the Jewish and Muslim words are more similar to each other than to the other varieties. So community members moved from India to Israel in two waves in the 1950s and the 1970s. And only a few dozen Jews remain in Kerala and most have shifted to the local variety of Malayalam. But in Israel, there is some post vernacular activity, a group of women who meet regularly to speak in Malayalam and study the script in Jerusalem and some sing-alongs and singing troops, especially uh, focusing on those wedding songs that I mentioned. And I'll give you, give you just a few little clips of this. Okay, and then here's one other clip from uh, the women's wedding songs.
Nevaya sadukane Impice de China Impice de China Caperi que lo lo haya Caperi que lo lo haya Okay, you see some Hebrew and some Malayalam in these songs. So Jewish Malayalam is in stage 8a, it's moribund, but there is some post vernacular use and it is important for group identity. So in conclusion, most of these long standing Jewish language varieties that we've been talking about, except Yiddish, are moribund. And in the next 20 to 30 years, for most of them, with the exception of Judeo Tat, the last speakers of native speakers of these languages will likely die. And so now is really the most important time to document these languages and the cultures and histories that go along with these languages and to share the knowledge of these languages. Why? Well, for the speakers of these languages who don't want their languages to die, such as Simon Mardachayev, a speaker of Judeo Tat or Juhuri who lives in New York but is originally from Azerbaijan, or Sarah Cohen who passed away just a few years ago and one is, was one of the last speakers of Jewish Malayalam in Cochin, India. But it's also important for the future, for, for academia, for um, scholarship about these languages and students who eventually want to learn these languages. And for Jews around the world, we want, to, we want Jews around the world to know about each other. And that's a very important goal of this wonderful organization that's hosting this event today. Um, it's also useful for other groups, for indigenous, immigrant, and religious groups to see how Jewish languages have differed from their non-Jewish correlates and how Jews are currently embracing these languages and engaging with them in post-vernacular ways. And they might get ideas for how they can then infuse their ancestral languages into their community life. So how can we raise awareness about Jewish languages and document them? Well, the Jewish language website, which I run, uh, does this to some extent. We have um, various books, uh, one book that I edited called Languages in Jewish Communities, Past and Present, and uh, other books uh, like this book by Lily Kahn and Aaron Rubin called The Handbook of Jewish Languages. And I also recently started a uh, Jewish language consortium where I brought together many, many organizations that are doing the important work to document endangered Jewish languages and to teach about them. And together we're sharing resources and doing uh, the work that we can to maximize the efficiency of, of this documentation work. Um, and my organization, the Jewish Language Project at HUC, uh, our mission is to promote research on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And uh, our vision is that every known Jewish language variety will be well documented. Comparative research will flower. That is, people who are researching how what Jewish languages have in common and how they differ from each other. Um, such as the use of Hebrew words across Jewish languages. Um, Post-vernacular activities in these languages will increase, and many Jewish children and adults will learn about Jewish language varieties. So our current projects to um, realize this vision are documenting endangered Iranian Jewish languages in particular, because that was the group of languages that I found had the least research on them so far. And we put out um, fun facts on Mondays and Thursdays and post other interesting things about Jewish languages most other days on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We have short films that we have commissioned about various Jewish languages. And um, we are also working on recording pronunciations for the Jewish English lexicon, which is 
a, a dictionary of Jewish English focusing on the Hebrew, Aramaic, Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Persian, etc., other words that are used by Jews within English. And we have lots of ideas for future projects that we are eager to do once we can find the funding for them. So thank you so much for your interest in Jewish language varieties, and I'm looking forward to having a conversation and hearing your questions. First, I just have to say, I know we've talked about some crossover here, but um, when you brought up Malayalam, I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm sorry, Malayalam, right? Is that So we're actually working on a clip right now on Ruby Daniel, who documented a bunch of uh, songs in Malayalam, and we also have one on um, a clip. So for those who don't know, we, we also have short clips. Uh, educational based and that's uh, Dr. Benor and I have been talking about that that we need to cross reference them and make sure people know because it's part of our heritage. I'm going to quote somebody in a minute. Um, but uh, Buena Sarfati Garfinkel also wanted to document all of the Ladino. So hers is already live. Uh, Ruby Daniel is coming live. And so yes, that's so much part of it. And Lynn just put it so well, uh, learning about Jewish communities around the world outside of Eastern Europe can enrich one's Jewish spiritual practices, one's own heritage, one's own identity, one's own view of the world. And yes, I think, I, I wow, hope you can agree with that. That's a great quote. Maybe I'll use that in a grant application. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's what I was thinking. So um, Elaine and Rachel, I see your hand has been up. I'm going to invite you to um, open your cameras and open your microphones. I will read you in the meantime. Um, the reference to al Hat. would you prefer I read them or you read them, the other questions? Oh, okay, I guess I could read them. So yes, the, the uh, reference to al Hat for, for Sunday uh, is because in Spanish, the word for Sunday is domingo and Jews understandably didn't feel comfortable referring to Sunday as the day of God. So they maintained a word that had been used perhaps by some of their ancestors in Spain, when Arabic was the primary language of Spain, um, al-had meaning day one, the day one of the week. Okay, Rachel, you had a question? You need to open your microphone, you're on mute. Okay. Uh, for, I, uh, first, I have to say, I never miss anything that uh, Dr. Benor uh, does, and uh, I always listen to her, and every time I learn something new. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, um, as you know, I am a native speaker of Ladino, one of those of a certain age. <laughs> I was born and raised in Turkey. And... Um, uh, the first point I want to make is that since I came to America, when uh, anybody, uh, with hardly anybody had ever heard of Sephardic Jews in the first place, and second, that uh, they claimed that if you don't speak Yiddish, you can't be Jewish. So we've come a long way since then, thanks to people like you. So thank you very much for that. Um, I just want to add about a few things about Ladino. There's so much going on that uh, it's impossible to uh, touch on everything. But I do want to say, you showed two clips uh, from Ladino music. Uh, one from Flori Giacoda and the other one from uh, Sara Rueste. Um, but having grown up with, this, with these songs, um, what uh, did, it seems to me important to also say that uh, most of our music, especially in Turkey, had the Turkish makams. Uh, Flori is from uh, Yugoslavia and has the Balkan uh, influence. But uh, when you showed um, I, uh, the um, Judeo-Arabic uh, music, that was closer <laughs> to the way I heard uh, the Ladino singing with that kind of Turkish makam. And definitely we use those uh, makams in our liturgy, both in Hebrew and Ladino. As you know, we also use Ladino in our liturgy. So those, uh, that 
was one point I wanted to make. And among the many other things um, that are, is going on, on in the Ladino world is that we do have radio programs also. There is one uh, coming out of Israel, the Can Ladino. Um, there, uh, there is one in Spain. Um, and there is uh, from Madrid, a friend of mine and her daughter do it has for the last uh, 30 years or so. And um, also uh, there was one until recently regularly coming out of uh, Paris. And Maybe we're talking you, about doing one from the United States. <laughs> that's wonderful. Maybe if you want to put it into the chat, people may be interested or send it as a follow-up email. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it as a follow-up email. I Thank think it's you. easier. I'm on my iPad. It's hard to type. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, and <laughs> for all that you're continuing to do on behalf of Ladino. Thank you. Clara, do you want to open your microphone? I see you have a question. Yes. Yes. Um, I have a question for Sarah. Um, I'm from Latin America, and I'm very aware of the differences in Spanish between the different among the different Latin American countries. My Spanish is quite different from Mexican Spanish and so on and so forth. Do you find that that influences in some way the Jewish Latin American Spanish or it, they're completely separate? Yes, absolutely. Um, the way that Jews speak Latin American Spanish in Mexico is very different from how Jews speak it in yeah. Cuba and in Puerto Rico and in Argentina, right? Uh, and Venezuela. And, and actually, even in Mexico City, the way that Jews speak Spanish is influenced by their ancestral languages. And there are four separate communities there. There are um, Syrian origin Jews from Aleppo and from Damascus, and there are uh, Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews. And so the, their ancestral languages influence the way that they speak Spanish, mostly the words that they use from their uh, various ancestral languages. Thank you. There, um, oh, and somebody agreed with you. A Cuban Jew here, I totally see the differences between the Latin American Jew Jewish Spanish. <laughs> Um, and thank you for saying about the Makams. Can you give some examples of Jewish English that don't come from Yiddish? Ah, yes. Um, well, there is a very large Syrian community in Brooklyn and uh, other parts of the New York area, and they use a lot of words from Judeo-Arabic. And there's a large uh, Sephardic community in Seattle, and they use many Ladino words. Um, and um, I'll just give you one example of a Ladino word that's used in Jewish English, specifically in Sephardic communities, especially in Seattle, the word bragas, which means underwear. And for some reason, this became a popular word in Sephardic Jewish English. Uh, Chaya, you have a question? Yeah, hi, first of all, thank you. This was so, so fun and so interesting. So my question um, sort of touches on your mission uh, related to comparative research. Um, so in your introduction, you, you used the phrase picked up a Jewish version of the local language or something like that. Um, and so I, I was curious if we could um, unpack a little bit what that means to pick up. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this um, Max Weinreich in, in his uh, book about Yiddish. He, he writes, and I forget the exact words, that Yiddish was different from, from German or the German local German dialect, like sort of on contact. Like as soon as Jews landed there, they, they, they spoke differently and that was sort of what continued. Um, Alexander Bader in his book on Yiddish dialects says, tells a completely different story and he sort of says that uh, Yiddish speakers in the German lands first spoke a pretty standard version of the local dialect and then over time, with their sort of inward looking um, culture, they, they diverge. Um, and I don't think we have enough evidence of the early stages of Yiddish to answer a question like that definitively, but it seems to me that by looking at the, like the, the scope of what you're doing um, might give us some information about um, 
how Jews, like you said, picked up <laughs> the local version. Of course, there wasn't a, a Yiddish ver there wasn't a Jewish version to pick up until they created it, right? Um, so I'm just curious if you have something to say. I mean, I have some intuitions just based on the Jewish English in more recent years and how that sort of formed, but I'm curious to hear your expert um, opinion on that or thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Chaya, and thanks for your great talk yesterday on Yiddish dictionaries. I love that we can go to each other's talks two days in a row. Um, and um, there, uh, this is a, a live issue in the history of Yiddish, but also the history of Jewish languages more generally. And I have argued that there, that it is useful to look at contemporary emerging Jewish language varieties to get a better understanding of how Jewish language varieties arose in the past. And you're right, it, it isn't really accurate to say picked up the, a Jewish version of the local language. What I meant was picked up the local language, but Judaified it, right? That um, they, in most places, Jews did pick up the local language, but the question is what, what did they first start speaking? And the answer is immigrants most likely did not speak exactly like the, the people around them because that's the case with any immigrant. As you know, when, when as most people know, when uh, people learn a language after around puberty, it's very hard for them to learn it in a native sounding way. And so that is exactly what's, um, what's going on when immigrants learn the language. The, the bigger question is what happens when their children learn the language? Because if their children have exposure to people who speak the local language, then they're gonna most likely pick up that variety. But the, the interesting thing to me is what features they maintain from their ancestral languages. And how else do they then later in the history of the language distinguish their language from non-Jews around them? So in my understanding of the history of Jewish languages, there are both substratal and superstratal um, influences, which means, in, which means um, the languages that they spoke before influencing the way they speak now, and um, new languages that they come into contact with influencing their languages, but also their languages just have innovations because of insularity. And I wouldn't say isolation because I don't think at any point in history, Jews were completely isolated from their non-Jewish neighbors. They always had some degree of interaction with them. And even in situations like Yiddish and Ladino, which were maintained away from the places where they originated, they had influences from the la languages around them. So Yiddish is influenced by Hungarian in Hungary, as Chaya's research points out. And, and, and Ladino is influenced by Serbo-Croatian in Yugoslavia and by Turkish in Turkey. There are so many Turkish words and other influences in, in Ladino. So when we look at the history of Jewish languages, it's really um, a balancing act between being a part of and apart from the local society. I always thought that, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I always thought that um, tumult was a Yiddish word, but it turns out it actually is an English word. Um, I go to a lot of social studies conferences around the country. And I just happened to end up in one in a, a university in the Pennsylvania Dutch country. And um, there were a lot of people there that were academically studying Pennsylvania Dutch as well as social studies in general. And they said that Yiddish and Pennsylvania Dutch are more similar to each other than both are to high German. Uh, I, uh, what's your take on that? And are there are other kinds of uh, connections like that that have been occurring. So the, what is the question exactly? Is the relationship between Dutch and Yiddish? Yeah, yeah. And, and Yiddish. And if there are other kinds of connections that I never thought of um, going uh, around with languages uh, where you, it's surprising, but there they are, there are connections uh, as offshoots of the original language. Yes, um, I don't know enough about Pennsylvania Dutch to say exactly which dialects it is descended from. And I also don't know enough about Yiddish to answer that because it's sort of controversial about 
which dialects of German are most similar to it and, and when it originated and when we can say that it broke off from uh, German as a separate language. Um, but you're right to point out the similarities that um, among uh, Pennsylvania Dutch speakers in Amish and Mennonite communities in America, there is um, a maintenance of a language from the old country, an immigrant language, because of insular communities and a desire to maintain separateness from society, just as there is in Hasidic communities with the use of Yiddish. The Sephardic areas have similar things going on because there were other Wait, sorry, uh, minority groups. There were other minority groups within the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. um, are there similar things going on with other languages like that uh, that were um, similar to the history of, of Ladino or similar to the history of uh, uh, the, the connection between uh, old language and new languages? Uh, is that going on uh, as a result of other minority groups that were in the Ottoman Empire? Yes, I think there were, but I'm gonna um, table that for a different session because mm -hmm. I think you, you wanna bring in an expert on Ottoman history to answer that. And uh, I have to say there are so many amazing questions out there and so many people that wanna ask their questions, but I wanna be conscientious of your time as well. I, I think we're going to, in addition to all the courses that are through the Jewish Languages Project um, and all of ours, I think we're gonna have to do this again, Dr. Benor, because uh, I, I just, you have to answer these questions. Like, and, and there are, there's just so much out there to talk about. Um, so, yeah, she say something just from praise. But, I'm really, really delighted at your presentation because of all the clips that you've added. I think they add great depth to what your discussion was, and I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. Since since I quoted Lynn, can we just let her ask her? <laughs> Well, yes. uh, I don't really have a question. I'm sort of a, polit a political uh, business person. My role at the synagogue when I joined was to uh, create the email list. So, uh, but uh, I, I just, someone else said that um, being not considered Jewish because you don't speak Yiddish or you're not Ashkenazi and look at me, I, I don't look Jewish. I could be in the Passover uh, aisle and I would, well, not before uh, COVID and I'll be talking to the other people and they won't recognize me. They won't even talk to me, you know, I'm, you know. And so I'm, uh, my mother's from England that has a long history of, of Judaism. And uh, I, were, I really, uh, and also I'm tired of uh, Borscht Belt humor at all my <laughs> synagogue <laughs> services, being a British person. And so when I'm, I, there's so many, I just, I will just, not, I have a lot of questions for you, but I just want to add that on YouTube, there are so many Sephardic Ladino uh, songs for Hanukkah, and it gave me a whole new uh, understanding of Hanukkah. It was just so wonderful, I, besides uh, latkes and, <laughs> and, all, and, and all of that. And uh, I really appreciate this because uh, there are so many different Jewish people, and uh, there was another person who said, uh, I wanted to, uh, to have solidarity with her. And... Uh, and all of you who are uh, expanding our Jewish experience uh, spiritually for me. Um, I, I'm on a soapbox. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all. And really, I know there are, uh, again, I'm going to repeat, there are so many good questions out there. Um, you will receive my email address in the follow-up email. Please send them to me. And then maybe uh, Dr. Benor and I can try to create a new session based on your questions. I really think that's the way to go at this point. Um, I do encourage you, March 13th is the last in the series of the Judeo-Persian um, series, <laughs> language series um, from the Jewish Language Project. So I do encourage you to go to that. We also have a program uh, on Judeo-Arabic Yemenite music coming up on Sunday. So please join that. We, we, this is part of our heritage. This is part of the Jewish narrative. I know somebody talked about cultural appropriation I don't know how you feel about it, but me personally, I believe this is the Jewish culture and it's on us to learn each other's so that we're part of the mosaic that makes up the Jewish people. And will I will be getting a recording of this. There will be a recording on uh, YouTube. Yeah, you'll Wonderful. receive the link. And thank, thank you so much, Dr. Benor. I hope this is the first of many. Thank <laughs> oh, you. Uh, Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Bye. Bye.